man let's get into it let's how about it. you introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about you okay i'm chris and i have a, uh you know bands i play in i was gonna say i have wine and beer but i was gonna go to the band thing i play in like a bunch of bands mortars and rough dreams and um uh james lee and the rest and a new thing i'm starting called rail that's like a power balance thing and other stuff whatever it's just you know, it's just music stuff hey <laughs> So, in as far as your memory serves, do you can you recall when you and I met? Uh, yeah, halftime pizza. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, my memory is really bad sometimes, but I remember that that was a really good night. I think it was. Uh, I think I played maybe solo and with domestic dispute and small wars was there. If that's the night I'm thinking of, yeah, yeah small wars wasn't the band yet. Um, oh, okay, it, it was. Uh, well, Greg from Small Wars was in Reckless Threat. It was the first Reckless Threat show. Okay. You played solo. Um, Domestic Dispute played, and that band, uh, the Sawed Offs. Oh, yeah, Georgia. the Sawed Offs from Georgia. Yeah, they, they were sick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, Duster Huffer. That song sucks. That's great. <laughs> that band keeps saying, like, he keeps saying that they're coming back, but it's been like three years. I, I hope they do. Yeah, I think, like, didn't he do, like, some vocal recordings, like, on the last Queries album or something? Pretty sure, like, Men or whatever. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah, I mean, as long as he's still doing stuff. If he can get the band back together, it'll be awesome, you know? Yeah, they were rad. Yeah. Yeah. So that was uh, that was the first time you and I met, and uh, your set that night blew me away. And uh, I, I hope you agree, but I feel like we've been friends ever since. And yeah, no, I, for sure. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love, I know that half the time you, you feel like, uh, I think you think that it's not what it is, but I love all the mortar shit. It's always just blown me away. And I don't know, man, like <laughs> I've never seen a, seen a mortar set that just didn't completely, you know, make me, make me want to reconsider what I'm doing in my life. So <laughs> it's weird <laughs> because, you know, being on like my side of things, like I remember the first like mortars stuff i ever recorded it wasn't even called mortars at the time i didn't have the name for it uh that i'll get into that in a minute but i had just recorded a few songs and i was out with my friends drinking and i kind of had the nerve i was like hey i have this one thing i think it was on a cd actually i was like you guys want to hear this song i recorded you know like i would played in bands before like so many bands but like i'd never really done like a solo thing like i really hadn't and so i was kind of nervous and i was like put it in and i was with my buddy travis and and it was the song about like not having any cash in your jeans and whatever. Um, no, there isn't is what it's called. And he just he loved it. And I thought, you know, just, we're just drinking. He loves it. But still to this day, like he was over here the other night and he was just like, you got to play that song. It's my favorite song. It's like, God, I guess, you know, but to me, it's just like this dumb stuff that I do on my own because all the mortar stuff is like all the recorded stuff, you know, is just me goofing around when I have time or like not goofing around because I take it way too seriously. For, for what it is, honestly, you know, and I had to figure out how to do recording programs I never worked with and like all this stuff. But on my side of things, it's just me at my house being kind of dumb, you know, and, 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 and then I play out and people like it, I guess. And I hear, you know, and it's cool. And like I, the last acoustic thing I did, like I heard like people singing along the parts and I was like, are you kidding me? I'm going to get lost. <laughs> but it was, it was cool. I, I, yeah. So I don't know. I, yeah. Um, Mortars, the name came from a, another band, a song I played in another band that I was in. That's, that's what I was going to loop back to. Anyway, thanks. What was, what was that? I've never asked that. I, I've, I've thought that before, but I've never asked you that question. So what was the crux of the name? 
Uh, I played in a band called Destroy Wave, and we were together for a pretty short time, but we did some cool shit. Um, and and I, I loved being in that band. It was just all about playing really fast and lots of downstrokes, and like it was it was really cool. But we had a song called Mortars, and I don't remember why I wrote it. I, I mean, I've always kind of like liked uh, World War One poetry, which is weird, but like some of it's very bitter and and of course because everything was just terrible at the time and i think it came from that but like i have no military experience i don't know shit about that like so i'm not like you know like uh i think you know when i first started playing some of that stuff like some people would ask me is like dude you, you know were you in the service I'm like fuck no dude i don't know shit like oh you know the, the name doesn't have anything to do with that you know so i don't know it's just you don't have i don't know I don't, yeah that's all I never, I, I never pieced that together. Like for me, I, I never in my, in, I never put the thought together that mortars had anything to do with military. I, I always just kind of assumed that the name came from maybe like self discovery or like trying to, maybe I thought it was like about trying to blow up your past and, you know, wipe, wipe away the, the bad memories or something. I don't know. I, maybe, I, maybe I was, maybe I was being a little bit too uh, philosophical but a lot of your songs are pretty philosophical. I, I guess. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I get introspective a lot, I guess, because I, I'm weird about writing songs. I, I if, if I had my songwriting notebook down here, I'm really slow about it, too. Um, but I revise everything a billion times, and I want it to be, like, as accurate as possible. But I also have a really hard time explaining exactly what I feel. And so it's like this... A hurdle to get over and so writing yeah. a song is kind of daunting to me but sometimes when they just flow it's like you know but still i just strike everything out and revise them 100 times it's probably why I like for for rough dreams like as far as lyrics go i haven't written that much you know like me and jake collaborate a lot on music and stuff but like for lyrics like the songs i've written have been pretty sparse compared to his but that guy he doesn't even write songs you know jake doesn't write songs he thinks of them in his head. He never even writes them down. And it's just like, I don't know how he does it. He's like a mutant because he can just think of a song in his head and remember it and just piece it together with his brain. And I'm like, dude, I, I, I forget like what I wrote two lines ago. <laughs> you know? wow. But yeah. So for him, lyrics come like as he's, you know, internalizing it. It's yeah. He just, I think he has that brain that just works that way. It just, he thinks of something and it works. And then I don't know how he all puts it together, but you know, yeah. he's, he's Jake has, he, he's very, uh, very good at lyric writing and it, it just works in a way I have never understood, but I, I'm just like in awe of it, you know, whereas mine, I'm just, I don't know, but yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, my lyrics are, I do take more time with that than anything else, you know, like writing lyrics that I think like actually say what I'm trying to say. Um, which is hard for me because I mean you hear me stammering all over the place now. I'm not the most eloquent guy, <laughs> but you know, yeah. It, it seems to me from the from the outside looking in, it seems to me like you probably um, it, songwriting as far as guitar, drums, bass. To me, it seems like that probably comes really easy for you. But then lyrically, it, it appears like it probably comes a little bit harder. But it also, I, I feel that way because your your songs are so eloquently put together and it's it's almost like poetic so i i feel like that, that can't be easy uh, if you're a very good guitar player I, I feel like i'm a half decent dipshit drummer and i don't have a very hard time writing drum parts so i feel like writing lyrics is you know on a scale of one to ten lyrics are right up there with the ten on on, on toughness whereas everything else if you know how to play your shit just you know put some chords together you're good to go yeah, lyrics are, I think, to me, the most important thing of all. Like, I love all kinds of music as long as, like, the the lyrics, like, speak to me or say something that I'm interested in. It doesn't even have to, like, speak to me necessarily as long as I can appreciate what it's doing. Um, and so I do spend a lot more time with that. I think maybe I'm overly critical of myself, too, and, like, some of the songs that I, I've wrote like years ago I listened to it and I'm like oh god this is so bad <laughs> you know but but it's it's it wasn't it was just 
I guess I came at it from a different approach. And I'll probably like think the same thing in the future because I guess we do, right? We're just like, oh, it's, this was, I've gotten so much better since then. Even though you don't think at the time that you will, you always seem to if you keep at it, you know? I don't know. Yeah. So when I get discouraged about stuff and like I don't write for a while, that's kind of something that I keep in mind. It's like one day I'll look back on what I'm doing now as like the inferior ones or whatever. The, the, the ones I'll be doing then will be so much better. It's like, just don't stop, you know, just don't stop, I guess. <laughs> I, I was talking to Tracy from Blitzkid about how they've been a band for so long that uh, we weren't talking about this, but we were talking about how they've been a band for so long that they've got these experiences that a lot of people like ourselves, you know, sadly won't experience I, you know I, I i don't know many i don't have many friends that have been in, in you know career bands and talking to him was funny because i thought to myself i bet i've, I've said this before there's songs that i play in my own bands that i think to myself this a couple years from now maybe even a couple months from now is going to get really boring and i don't know that i'm going to want to continue to play this song i think that about songs all the time even though even though if it's one that i really like but I imagine if you've been working toward 20, 15, 20 year career, I imagine that there's, there's gotta be a breaking point where you're just like, I know that we're doing this for the fans, but this song sucks. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure that's the way it is with anything. Did it feel like when we re-recorded your band's song, another Friday night was there to tell, okay, so, Reckless Threat and Mortars did a split a couple years ago for people watching this or listening to this podcast. And you covered a Reckless Threat song. We covered a Mortar song. And then we did a um, a Chris Suggs song. But it was – what was your band called? Shots to the Curb. Yeah. We covered one of their songs together. Like Reckless Threat played the music and you sang it. Was there – was there um, was that an enjoyable experience for you? Or were you just like, oh, God, that song is something that I've – it passed you by kind of thing. No, no, that, that is one that is like actually stood the test of time for me for a lot of reasons. That was one that me and my friend, Adam, who lives in Pittsburgh now, that's one we kind of like wrote almost together. And I don't usually write lyrics together, but he had the idea for it and came up with it and we kind of perfected it together, I guess. And it just ended up exactly where we were at that point in life. It, it, I, I stand by that song. That's one of the ones from the catalog that I, yeah. So when you guys like said that you want to do that one, because I think you heard it on the, on that Mercury comp thing yeah. I, pu I put out. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, I was like, yeah, that's that, that one. Definitely. Anybody who wants to ever fuck with that one. <laughs> you know, let's do it. Yeah. I love that comp you put together so much. There's so many like, Cause I'm not from here. I moved here in 2012. So I didn't experience the the nineties and the, in the two early two thousands in this scene, but there's so much good shit that I missed, but that shot to the curb record that you have up on Bandcamp, I mean, that stuff is so current. I can't believe you guys put out a record and I don't know how they used to, you, I think you told me that band really didn't last that long. No, we were not around long at all. Yeah. It's so crazy. Cause but. that record right now, if we put out that record right now and released it as like a new thing, just to fuck with people and just made up a band name, it it sounds so current. That's I, that's cool. I yeah, we uh, honestly we I think it was after school. We were still in high school when we recorded it, and we went to Underground Recording Studio in Seymour and knocked it out in like one evening, and yeah. he just had it all done but we practiced a lot beforehand we had a bunch of stuff that was never released and some of it was actually real good like i might honestly on the next mortars album go way way back and do a shot to the curb song that never went anywhere and like turned it into a mortar song <laughs> because it's you know it's one of those that i you know i think if i don't know sometimes the inspiration is just there and you know sometimes you just gotta like bring it to life. I don't know. I don't know. You know, maybe it'll flop like the song, but I think it's a good one. Like I was listening to the other night. I was talking to the other night a little bit, like texting or whatever. And I was like, I came across all these old songs that I was like, man, some of these actually have potential. Some of them were just like garbage, but you know, there was, there was some potential in there. So I might, I like to do that. Um, on the last Mortars album, there's, um, there's a couple on there. Actually, no, there's probably just one. It's like an older one. Um, 
the mortar song actually yeah from destroy wave but yeah yeah yeah, yeah there that the another friday night song um this isn't that interesting but i'll tell it anyway for you know the, the three or four months i listened to that song before we finally decided to do that song as a cover on that seven inch i thought you were saying in the lyrics i thought you were singing another friday night in east tennessee and then when when you cut the lyric in the studio for our split i watched you record it and i was like he's saying in this dead end scene dead end scene like, yeah if you listen to it it's like they either, either way would work. I love it. I do like have, um, it's funny because like some of the things I'll say, like for my friends, listen to the music, whatever, like they'll hear things that I don't say. Like there were lines in, in songs that I thought I was being really clear and everybody's like, what are you saying there? Or it's like, they, they have this different idea of what I'm saying. I'm like, God, like I, I thought I'm, I'm like enunciating, enunciating as well as I can. <laughs> You know, hey. clearly it's not a strong suit for me, but hey, everybody's inter- that just adds to uh, where anybody can like interpret it their own way, I guess, you know, yeah. so that's yeah. Don't be so hard on yourself. I found this YouTube channel where this guy literally interprets like like famous songs, um, basically like rock songs or, you know, a lot of punk songs, faster stuff. He interprets it the way he thinks it is. And he re-records the songs with the lyrics that he thinks they are. And then he has people tell him, like grade him on how wrong his lyrical interpretation was. So it's like the Green Day covers are hilarious because his his words are so fucked up. Like oh, he's yeah. so Billy Joe is just do you remember when we were kids when Green Day first hit? Like when that damn basket case video came out? I, I don't know if it happened to you, but I thought they were European. The first time I saw a Green Day video, I was like, these guys. Like, I don't know if you came, you might have known them. A lot of people, I, I've literally never heard of Green Day till that video. Basket but a lot case. of people, that's the case was the one for me too. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people knew them from the lookout shit. I was a, I was an Op Ivy fan before Green Day, but I just never knew Green Day. I guess I, I guess I wasn't that deep in the, in the lookout catalog. So I was one of those, I came, became a Green Day fan. And then around the time of Insomniac, I went back and listened to, you know, Slappy and Thousand Hours and all the other records. But yeah, when they first came out, I was like, this band is like this. I remember telling my sister, like, this band, they're from England. Because I was just a dumb right. kid. didn't know any better. And I remember no, that. Funny that everybody thought that Billy Joe was from, was British. Yeah. It was like, a, I think he described it as a Brit imitating an American imitating a Brit or something like at one point, which is right on. But yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I'll even notice like sometimes like one one band that has really hard to understand what he's saying, uh, Teen Idols. They were a Tennessee oh, band yeah. from Nashville. I love the Teen Idols. But even now to this day, if I actually like, I know what the words sound like, but like if I actually think about what I'm saying, I'm like, that's not a word. Like I'm just yeah. singing vowels and consonants that don't make a word. And that's just what I've heard like certain lines in my head as, you know, <laughs> which is funny, but yeah, no, cause I always still sing along. You know, I also love them a lot. They're great. Um, but yeah. So you, you mentioned teen idols. I don't know if I've ever told you this, you, you know, that comp that I put out last Christmas that you're on the, the shitters full Christmas comp. Yeah. Did yeah. You, did you know that one of the bands on that comp has the singer from teen idols on the song? Heather. Heather. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 10 days till didn't Christmas. Know I was talking about. Yeah. No, I knew, I, I knew that that was her. Yeah. Um, we'd actually talked to her a little bit about doing some backup vocals for the rough dreams, uh, record, one of the songs. And, uh, it was funny because like, I, you know, we were, she, we have a mutual friend in Gainesville, which she lives there now. And we were like texting back and forth about, you know, just like the part that she would do and like sending it to her and all that. It didn't end up working out, but it was still cool. Cause I was like, man, like you know now i'm just like yeah, i'm just talking to like a fellow musician who would do something for us like but i'm still a little bit like oh it's out of dude i don't you know like come on it, it, it is so that that's cool um yeah i know i think that's really cool that that also i you know i knew that you wanted a punk song and sorry i gave you like a real like christmas song on that. <laughs> even though it's not maybe christmas but yeah i was like yeah, I love Christmas music though. That's yeah. I, I really do. But yeah, your song on that comp is so good, and it's such a letdown because I mean, this is this is a basically me shitting on myself, but 
if I had more stroke, I would try, I would love to do everything I can to make that song bigger. Cause I think, I think that song has potential to be an actual like Christmas song. You know what I mean? Like that song is fucking good. I think that could be one of those songs that people spin on their Spotify Christmas punk playlist, but oh, it's like, know. it's like fairy tale of New York, except I don't drop any like, you know, <laughs> homophobic slurs. I'm joking. That's not, I love fairy tale of New York. It's great. It's, it's part of its time, but yeah, no, no, my song is not, it's just like a minute long. And it's again, it was, I, I, I think I wrote it like years and years back, but I kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I used to have a thing like, I don't know. I don't want to get into it, but in this basement where I'm sitting right now, like, used to just do Christmas here, like with my friends and we would just get drunk down here. And it was like, that was Christmas, you know? So I don't know, whatever. Um, I just yeah. like how the song is melancholy, but uplifting at the same time. It actually made me cry a couple of times listening to it. When you first sent it to me, I don't know that I told you that I'm probably letting something go right now, but when you first sent it to me and I listened to it, I was working, I was driving down the road and I started crying. And I got I got to a customer because I used to deliver pharmaceuticals. Yeah, and I got to one of my got, got to one of my stops, and I was I was at a pharmacy, and I had to go in because I had a, a time delay. That was like one of those things where I had medicine that had to be delivered at, at a certain time, and I was really running late, and I had to go in, and I was like red eyed. And what's wrong with you? And I was like, oh my allergies, but I I would I had been like kind of like losing it over your song. <laughs> It's like I've definitely not been touching these pharmaceuticals. I'm good. <laughs> but no, that's that's yeah, that's thanks, amazing. man. Uh, that's that's probably like you were talking about introspective, like that's a very introspective song. You know, I think like a lot of songs can be like brought down to like that one line that kind of like ties everything together. And I think the last line of that song is the one that just brings it all together, like you know, like when you're looking back at the year, cause we all do, you know, we like try to always, I guess, you know, we're still alive. So try to always do better than we've done before. And I, I think even if we're like at our worst, we still want to do better or whatever. And so like, you look back at, at what you've really done, like honestly, and evaluate it, you know, which is not, I mean, it's hard to do, but yeah, it's like, what have I done? Or like, what, what could I have done? Like, you know, like this is just another year, you know, like, yeah. Who's, who's, I don't know. Yeah. I think that's, what's really hard about the holiday season is around the holidays. You get um, people do that. They get introspective. They get on that whole wet wave of what did I do this year? What did I accomplish? I had goals at the beginning of the year. Why didn't I accomplish them? And people, you know, it's financially, it's, it's, it's strapping and it, it's a hard time of year. There's that, you know, seasonal depression and then straight into January and everybody wants to, Oh, I'm going to change this about my life this year. I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to stop drinking. And like, everybody gets that new year's resolution. What a fucking like 40 day, like Thanksgiving to like mid January is just like 60 days of strife and bullshit that we cause ourselves it's totally unnecessary, but it's kind of just a part of goes hand in hand with what we as, you know, humans put ourselves through in the holidays. I don't know that everybody does it, but I know that every year I tell my wife, we're going to do better next year. And every year the holidays, we're never prepared financially. We're always a mess. We argue. It's like we make it way more than it needs to be. I would love to have a holiday season where it's just chill. See your family eat some food, not worry about bullshit. Don't dwell on the past, but every year <laughs> it's like a yeah. vicious. Song. Yeah. I, I, I get that. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't ever set New Year's resolutions because I know yeah, myself I too well, <laughs> like, you know? And so I don't put too much stress on the holidays either. And uh, yeah, I, but I do think there, there needs to be, times like even if it's not the holidays like even if it's whenever that you know we just like kind of look back like i've had to do that kind of recently you know with myself because you know like being in a band and touring a lot and like being busy all the time like sometimes you gotta like keep yourself in check like all right am i going off the rails a little bit you know am i being smart like no <laughs> you know let's pull it together a little bit more you know like, yeah, I mean, like, I remember, dude, thank God for for you guys, because when I went to, uh, was it Murfreesboro or Nashville? 
And I was just there and I was like, I don't know how I'm getting home. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, regular stretch playing. These guys love me. I'm going to ride with them. I you know, <laughs> hope you guys love me. And you guys gave me a ride at least. That was a, a good conversation on the way back and stuff. So, yeah, I love y'all. But, yeah, it was, it was times like that where you got to like every now and then take like an evaluation of like, what are you doing? And like, all right, we need to like do a little better on this. And so I guess that song is just like the – you know, the, putting it in the year form. But we don't need to go on about that. We can talk about other stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was a funny night, just to put a bow on that, what you said. So, Reckless Sense playing a show in Murfreesboro. Um, we had no expectations of seeing Mackenzie or you. I knew Joey was coming. But here comes Joey walking through the door, and then here's Mac, and then here's Chris Sucks. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? So... <laughs> We played the show. Everything's fun. We had a good time. And Dylan had a session the next morning, a recording session at 9 a.m. So we had to peace out before the queers went on. And we go to leave. And I go out back to tell Julia and Mackenzie and a couple other people bye. And Mac was like, so Chris is riding back with you, right? And I was like, I mean, he can, but I, it's news <laughs> to me. And she goes, oh, well, he said he was going to ride back with you guys. And I walked over and I asked Forrest. I said, Forrest, did Chris talk to you? And he was like, about what? And I said, riding <laughs> And Forrest said, no, but he can. And I was like, yeah, that's what I said. So the, my favorite part was about a week later, we, you and I were hanging out at a show. And I asked you, I said, so what were your plans? Did you just think, oh, they'll have room in their vehicle to get me home? And you, you looked at me straight face. You said, I didn't even know you guys were playing the fucking show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you had driven... You had driven you you had ridden three hours away from your home, three probably three and a half, four hours away from your home, and with no plan of getting home. And all I knew is that Mackenzie told me she goes, well, I'm not driving you home. <laughs> <laughs> no, because like, yeah. No, uh yeah, that was yeah, that was pretty much it. Um I knew that'd I had been, like, that'd have an Uber ride. That'd have been about a three hundred dollar Uber ride. That would have been terrible. Like, <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I yeah. No plan. Yeah. So that was one of those times where I'm saying you got to take like a, you know, like an evaluation of, all right, what have I done? Like, what can I do better? Like, yeah, that was, uh, that wasn't my smartest moment, but that was a fun time. I had a good, I had a good weekend, I think. Oh, it was, it was a great, the, the drive home was amazing. Oh yeah. We had a great conversation. It was, it was fun. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah. At one point I was, I was chatterboxing like I do and Forrest, <laughs> We were like probably 45 minutes from Knoxville and I'm just talking, talking, talking. And he goes, Hey man, are you talking to me? And I said, no, I'm talking to Chris. He's like, he's asleep. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how long I've been talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I missed whatever. I was enjoying our conversation, but yeah, after, after a while, you know, it, it's just it's crash mode, I guess. Yeah. I, yeah. I did. Hey, thanks for, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it though. I had uh, that. That was a very similar story. That night was very similar to, to a night that I had with someone who who shall remain nameless. When I got a call at three a.m., this was about five years ago. I get a call at three a.m. from a, a friend who uh, called me and said, "Hey, what are you doing?" And I was like, "It's three a.m. I'm a fucking sleep." <laughs> and they proceeded to say, "Well, I'm drunk, and I'm in." Severeville at the roaming gnome and I don't have a ride home and I don't know how I got here. And I was oh. like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I <laughs> middle, middle of the night drove to Severeville or Pigeon Forge, wherever, wherever the roaming gnome is Severeville, right? Yeah. Severeville. She's been like, look around. Is Chris there? <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing was that was right before we met you. Oh, okay. Oh, hell. I might've been there. <laughs> might have. Yeah, I love you know. I, I miss that. We have one in Maryville. I miss it. Yeah, uh, I love the gnome. One of my best friends, Darren, works there, and we play there, you know, quite a bit with Rough Dreams. And and James Lee and the rest is playing there. I'm doing some solo shit there, so like Darren is like booking good shit, trying to like get things going good, like at a place in Sevierville, you know, like as much as you can. Because I mean, you you know, like it's hard to like in a place. Like uh, Marvel, for example, the Burden Book is like the first place I've known of in Marvel that is like kicking ass and putting a good place for like all sorts of musicians and artists and people from all different communities, you know. 
And that's awesome. It's I never knew about anything like that in Maribel before. Maybe that's just because I don't live there and I'm ignorant about it. But, yeah. you know, no, it's, I, I, it's yeah. definitely, I mean, it's the Burden book has been doing that as long as they've been open, but it's less than five years. And yeah. We, you know, Ann and I live in Knoxville now, but we, when we first moved here in 2012, we lived in Maryville. We lived in Maryville for eight years. And I mean, there was the Irish pub. You can go see a shitty cover band or you could go see a shitty cover band at Smoky Mountain Brewery, or you could go see a shitty cover band at Two Doors Down or fucking Brackens. But those are all just cover band bars and they yeah. wouldn't touch a band. So yeah, the, the Burton Book's the only place in Blount County doing original music. And nobody can tell me different because I've never seen anything differently in that town. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's like in Sevierville. I mean, yeah, I don't, I've lived here forever, you know, and I, don't know of any place like there, there was a place for a little while uh, called the refuge. And it was like back in probably 2003, I played in a band, one of those bands that, okay, you know, those bands like that phase of time where you have like a name, but there's no spaces in the name. I was in one yep. of those bands. <laughs> we yep. played at the refuge once and it was really cool. And there was a bunch of kids there and stuff. It was a good time. Uh, but after that, it was like, that was the one and only thing survival's ever had. And I, you know, I don't think like the, the gnome is going to be like the salvation of whatever, but like if we can get people open to like actual bands coming in and playing, like maybe, you know, like that's not just cover stuff because uh, are we not tired of the cover stuff yet? Like I love some bands, like they're playing, like if I'm drinking and like they're doing a good job of it, but there's so many that just, just like, dude, really this song again? Like if you play the Eagles, I'm fucking out, you know, <laughs> like, dude. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so yeah, it's so, I don't know, like, yeah, bringing, bringing stuff to places that maybe haven't had it before, but are kind of ready for it. It's yeah. so important. You know, I wonder, I wonder if the refuge is the place. So I was in a band called the heartbreak kids and that's the record that we redid as reckless threat. Mm -hmm. yep. So the heartbreak kids played a show in Sevierville one time that, the early 2000s, like I'm saying like either 02, 03, or 04, but probably close to 03. We played a show in Sevierville at this place. There was a ton of kids there skating. I remember it being punk kids, and it was badass. Was it a brick building, and you could see the courthouse from it? Yeah. Yep. That's it. That was the refuge. That was the one and only place we ever had that had stuff like that. Yeah. That yeah. place was awesome. We, it was great. We, I have so many memories that night. The show was amazing. That band was called the Heartbreak Kids, and on that tour, we did like a four-day a tour, but it was a four-day run, and one of those shows was that show in Sevierville, and on that, that run, that was the first run where we had changed our name from the Heartbreak Kids to Darling Articles. The Heartbreak Kids were like a pop-punk, Screeching Weasel, Huntington's, Ramones type band, and yes. we started, you know, I, I replaced the drummer, and we lost a guitar player, and it was just one original member and me and a new guy. And we started writing these songs that were a little bit more like what was going on at the time, the Hives, uh, Jet, uh, mm -hmm. fucking Kings of Leon, that type of shit. It was more punk because we weren't that great. So we were more like a punk, like we were kind of like basically a Hives ripoff because it had a little bit of punk to it, but it was still rock and roll, that like rock and roll hey. revival shit that was going on in 03. So we changed our name because we were no longer pop punk. And it was so funny. There was the, the promoter of that show, whoever that person was, who was just a sweetheart and paid us like there was a ton of people there that I remember us being paid real well, ton of kids skating. Somebody tried to break into our van. That was my one memory is we with one of the times I can remember in my in the three times of my life being on tour, almost getting robbed was one of those was that show. But it was just a dipshit who wanted to steal my big book of CDs that I stupidly you remember the, the, the books that were like this big? Dude, Stupidly. I, I bet I don't know who that guy was because, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some <laughs> That'd be so funny if, if you could tip with, but they didn't not, steal Not that he's a friend, not that he's a friend at all, but yeah, 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 no, that, yeah. There was a dude doing that for a while. And so, yeah. go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, 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 yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he got what was coming to him, though. So <laughs> Nice. So <laughs> I, uh, 
so I, 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 this was so funny. The guitar player in our band is sitting the outside, you know, he, the, 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 the promoter of the show, I vividly remember the promoter of the show was the one that came inside. We're sitting at the merch table and he was like, Hey man, somebody's trying to break into your vehicle. We stopped it, but we want to know what you want to do. A couple guys have him cornered and I go outside and I was just like, I talked to the dude and I was like, what were you trying to do? And he's like, I was just trying to steal your CDs, man. And I was like, just fuck off. And he, he took off and he, he was on a skateboard and he just peaced out. So we're outside talking to the promoter and the promoter said, so originally you guys, when you first booked the show, we had put you on the flyers, the heartbreak kids. And then, you know, a couple of days before the show, you let us know you changed your name. Why'd you change your name? Dude, like, like, like nothing without thought, the guitar player in our band at the time, Aaron, without question, without thought, just off, off the top of his head, just spurred it out. Oh, the WWF tried to sue us because of Shawn Michaels, the heartbreak kid, you know, so we had to change our name. And just straight face said it, and that stuck. That band was a band for like two more years as Darling Articles, and that became a thing. Like people at clubs, we, we played. I remember we played Meadville, Pennsylvania, one time, and a dude was like, "Man, my friend from Tennessee told me you guys got sued by HBK." <laughs> Holy shit! This was like early. You know, O three is pretty early into the internet. Like we're like five, yeah. months, not even ten years into the internet at this point. And I mean, this is pre MySpace, and there was people that knew in like three states away that stupid joke that he just offhand made. Dude, that's funny. We like at a little bit before that, but when I was in Shot to the Curb, like, and even before that, the band Against the Wall, we had to like figure out a name for like we didn't have to, but we thought it'd be cool to figure out a name for our label to put stuff out on. So we came up with Bloodline Records, right? And this was like. Yeah. 97 probably and then one day adam gets a cease and desist letter from this bloodline records bloodline <laughs> records and it's like all right dude we're literally just like printing these you know like on a I, just like printing them from a computer and cutting them out and like yeah. there's like 10 of our friends that have this like but cool we'll cease and desist <laughs> like that's whatever it was like do we bloodline uh, yeah. records that sounds like it was probably like a shitty christian hardcore label or something it apparently was like hip-hop something okay. something hip-hop and, and yeah but it does sound like that yeah and so it probably wasn't the best name to choose in the first place but i don't know why like that i think that was adam so you know yeah um if if, if, if adam watches this like dude what'd you pick bloodline for <laughs> man i just wish there was a way to figure out if your if one of your bands played that show that we played uh, there was a band. It's actually my neighbor across the street right now. His band. Uh, they were called Kelsey's Ocean. They were like really like kind of like that old school hardcore stuff. And the band I played in at the time that was uh, with no spaces and all lowercase letters. The way I feel. So <laughs> such a bad name. Um, yeah. And I don't. I don't think you guys were on it. Like, cause I think I would have remembered. You know that kind of music being here. But yeah. I don't, I wish I was there. I'm I, for a fact, we played that place. Yeah, that's, I, I yeah, I don't think I was there, but God, that would have been cool. Such that, a, I mean, such a that that night, that, my other funny story about that night is, uh, so we played there and then we went and I'm going to forget the name of it, but you would know over in, in Pigeon Forge, there's that diner. That's like an old fifties diner. That's the mm -hmm. shit. I can't remember what it's called. It's called ate, Mel's Diner. Yeah, yeah. We, we ate there, and then we stayed very close to there, like within walking distance, because we went to our hotel, found out our hotel was infest. I mean, like, the I, seriously, dude, I've never stayed in a place like this. So we left the show. The show was amazing. We go stay in a hotel that we literally, we did this thing where Aaron at the time was a salesman. The guitar player was a salesman. Did, I don't remember what he sold, but he had that, like, whole mentality, and he said, listen, I'm going to get us a cheap hotel. We didn't have a hotel. We had no clue where we were staying. And we were thinking, you know, we were young in our 20s. And just like anybody, even now in my 40s, I still try to do this. We tried to do the whole crashing on somebody's couch thing. And nobody at the oh, show, yeah. even though the kids there, nobody had it. So we're, we're, we're like, we're not sleeping in this minivan with five guys because we had a merch guy with us. So I was like, well, let's get a hotel. We got paid probably 100 bucks. Fuck it. Let's just blow all that money and have a good time. He was like, no, no, no. We're going to get a cheap hotel. So he did that thing where I don't think you can do this now, but back in the day, you could walk up to a hotel and straight up just be like, here, I'm here on business. It's after midnight. Give me a business rate. 
and they would give you the room for next to nothing. Maybe that still exists. Whoa, I don't really? know. But we paid fifteen dollars cash. Like, like I, I, I like for for a fact, he paid cash, fifteen dollars, no tax. They didn't take our. I mean, the hotel was sketch as fuck. Oh, but it was an actual. <laughs> sure. It was one of those hotels that's very close to that Mel's Diner, and it was definitely like multiple stories, like a four story hotel. Mm -hmm. But our room, we walked in and the bugs scattered. I've never experienced oh, this in my life. That it was bad. Like. Bugs scattered at night. We all well, slept on the sheets. It was bad. But when we got in the room, we were just like, this is bad. We were going to order pizza. But we didn't want to eat in the room. So we, we, we walked to Mel's Diner and ate <laughs> and had the, had the most fun. We were there to like 3 a.m. So we didn't want to go back to the goddamn room. But yeah. it's still one of the most memorable nights of my life was in the Pigeon Forge Severe Real area. Yeah, that yeah, it's it, there's lots of bugs and, and sh shitty hotels. And, yeah. It's it's the it's the whole resort town thing. There's there's so many when you go to Myrtle Beach, you're you're hard pressed to find a hotel that isn't just infested with bugs or just the worst the worst kind of shit. Dude, literally when you were telling me the story, it reminded me of Myrtle Beach because <laughs> uh, the same band, uh, well not the same band I was just talking about, but one before Shot to the Curb, we played in Myrtle Beach at a place called the Lazy Eyed. It was probably around two thousand, and we stayed in this hotel. And there were literally blood stains all over oh. the place, all over the room. We're like, somebody died in this room and they gave it to us because we were a bunch of fucking dumbass kids, like on tour. Like nobody's been in this room since. But yeah, it was disgusting. It was terrible. Um, but yeah, Myrtle Beach hotels. It's like we are the Myrtle Beach without the beach, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. we're not Branson, Missouri, at least. So, you know, I've never been there. Have you ever been to Branson? No, I don't want to go because it's just like us, except even lamer somehow because they don't have mountains. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it has cool stuff like just random like stand up comedy. Like, you know, how Survival and Pigeon Forge, we have that kind of like there's dinner shows and all that. Yeah, the there's like the hee haw. And, yeah. yeah. But Branson has like like legit stand up com comedians go to Branson and just like Do work they, out. The that, all right. I know like. I think Marty Robbins, like one of my favorite uh, musicians, or people in music of all time, like did a like a um, residency maybe or something in Branson or maybe it was a tribute act. I don't remember. But, yeah, I, I really enjoyed Marty Robbins. So if he if Branson was cool enough for him, it's probably cool enough for me. And not to. I, all right. So I remember being a kid like um, at Dollywood here. We used to go to the uh, Show Street Theater after after the park would close like they would have bands playing like country music and that was one of the places like that i would go with my parents and we would watch like bands play and my dad would get like all he'd wear like his nicest shirt it had like buttons on it and stuff you know and we go uh watch some country music at, at the the place so it's not all bad i mean there's some there's some okay shit but there's just so much yeah. dumb fucking you know touristy shit and trashy shit around here it's just you know, I don't know why I still live here, but I do. And, you know, I, I, it's fine. It's fine. You know, so. You own your house, right? Yeah. Well, I do. It was. Yeah. I got lucky with that one before everything. I, I could. That's another thing. I, I think I could sell this and make like three times what I paid for it because it was a foreclosure and like a bunch of shit. But yeah, whatever. That's it's. Yeah, I'm here. So it's cool. There's a yeah. Christmas tree in this basement I'm looking at. That's not from this Christmas, but the last one. <laughs> and it's not been watered since, and it's still alive somehow. We're it, me and Alan are going to try to figure out how to like clone it and like sell it as the Christmas tree that doesn't ever die. So it's like a, I don't know. It's, there's you something special a, about it. You have a fake tree, and you just don't realize it's fake. It's real. It's real. This is a real ass tree. This is like a totally real tree. I don't know why I'm like. I just look over at it, but yeah, yeah, it's it's real. You, but you take it. Do the do the ferns fall off? Um. Not really. I could bring the camera over there if you like. <laughs> That's crazy. That's the craziest shit ever. Usually a Christmas tree, if you get a Christmas tree on December 1st, by the 15th, you've got the fucking needles all over the ground already. You've got you've got the, the Christmas tree that will not die. <laughs> it will not die. It's 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 been the same. It's like a constant in this basement now. We're just gonna see how long it'll last. Um but yeah, it's still green. It's still green. It's yeah, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to send me a picture of that. that that's something I, else. I, I, 
So let's uh, let's get on to a little bit of a uh, of future business. What do you um, have in in the pipeline for mortars and for rough dreams? All right, yeah, for mortars, this is going to be. I definitely want to release at full length this year, you know, and I've got songs. I've been working out a bunch of stuff and I think it's about, it's going to be about ready. I don't know how I'm going to record it. Cause I'm really weird about like when I'm recording that stuff, I like to do it on my own, but I'm also not good at it. So I got to be really comfortable with somebody, <laughs> which is strange, but you know, um, so that, but rough dreams has way more tangible things immediately. Like we got uh, some mixes back that are being, worked on right now by peter you know um and so he's fixing those up making them really really pop and there's an ep that should be out soon it's the escapes it's um to me like i think the 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 trajectory of rough dreams does not make any sense you know like we started with an ep which is a good place to start then we did like a two song thing which was fun then a covers ep which was a weird thing then our first album was like a concept album and it's like who does that but to us at the time it made sense you know and i think it'll hopefully catch on in a few years you know you know if somebody like picks it up and decides like oh shit this is really cool but the next thing we're doing this next ep is kind of like just tracing our steps to the next direction it's a lot more um less rigid i think than than sticking with the concept album kind of thing and it's also the first thing we've ever all written together, like with, you know, Paul and Jake and me and Matt. It's um, it's kind of like all of us contributing to the, the, the soup or whatever, you know. But yeah, that, that, that's coming out. And uh, James Lee and the rest too, uh, you know, we're doing, um, hopefully recording soon. We've been talking about recording a couple tracks to put out uh, on a record, which would be really sweet that's been something that, that Jimmy's wanted to do for a while. And I would love to be a part of that. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the plans. I reckon. And I can say that, uh, I, I won't speak on other things, but I, I can say for a fact that the, the James Lee and the rest seven inch will be out on coffin curse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would love to do the mortar stuff on there too. If we can, yeah do that like that's because we talked about that you know like that would be awesome yeah i just i didn't know how how willing you were to talk about that right now but yeah that's that's yeah, gonna happen let's do it let's do it yes cool yeah <laughs> so uh one question i like to ask everybody for these interviews is what is your gateway what was your gateway to punk rock what led you to being uh, so involved in this community do you is there a gateway moment for you that you can finger point there's like, I guess, two pivotal moments that are very different from one another, if that's okay. Uh, yeah. The first one was discovering um, Look What the Cat Dragged In by Poison. <laughs> and, and as dumb as that might sound to me, that was like, I love that record still. And that was the first time like I saw like people just guys, you know, like in makeup and like, looking like whatever they wanted to look like. And to me, I still think that's a pretty fucking punk rock thing to do, especially in these days, you know? And so, yeah, I thought that that just kind of changed my way of thinking about it a lot. My cousin had the tape and I was just like, I don't know what this is, but I want to hear it. I was a very young kid and I loved it. Um, and other than that, I, I, I would say probably, I don't even know, like, when I first got into punk rock, but I know the first shows I went to around here were like at the Mercury theater. And it was, <laughs> I'm really glad for what we have going now in Knoxville because back then what I remember, I was too young to drive. So like our drummer would drive us and it was like just so much blood at every show. Just somebody, their whole face covered in blood. Somebody else got, you know, just busted up. And it was, it, it's, it's gross, but at the time, it's intoxicating, I guess, when you're like, feel like a, a young kid experiencing something like that for the first time. You're like, oh God, this is a weird world. You know, this is, I think that's why so many young people still discover Gigi Allen and they're like enthralled with him. It's like, no, the guy sucks. He's a piece of shit. But it's like this whole thing you didn't know existed. It's like peeling back the layers. 
you know, it's like finding that ear in a vacant field, like in blue velvet, you know, and that was what it was to me, I guess. Um, yeah. So I guess watching the alignment at the, uh, the Mercury or playing my first show at the Mercury when I was like 15, that was when it just like, it was like in my blood, you know, I was infected. I could, and, and still haven't gotten over it for better or worse, but yeah. Yeah. Poison and then mercury poisoning. So that's where that comes from in a way. That's a, that's a great answer though, man. Like most people will say, and I mean, if it's your experience, it's your experience, but most people will say, Oh, well, like for me, I, I can say that, you know, somebody handed me a Metallica, you know, garage days cassette. And I, they told me to listen to misfits. And then I became a punk fan. A lot of people will say, Oh, so-and-so my cousin, my sister, my brother, that's really cool that your experience is like you, you got into punk whenever you started going to punk shows. I mean, I got super like knee deep, like lifelong punk when I started going to local shows and all of my friends bands, almost like the high school bands that I went and like grew up with and completely loved when I was 14 and they were 16 and I thought they were so old cause they could, you know, they could play shows, but that's, that's a pretty cool experience. But the fact that it sounds like you basically, fell in love with punk by being a part of the community. That's pretty rad. I guess. I mean, I was, I was a very limited part. I was like this spectator almost, you know, but it didn't take long. I guess by the time I was like 18, I was like booking shows at this place called McGee's that was super sketch and, and access and, and places like that. And like knew a lot more people. So, you know, you stick around for a couple of years and, and you meet people, you know, and you grow, I guess or whatever. And so, yeah, it's just that kind of thing. Cause there's a lot of people that are here for a while, then they're gone, you know? Um, and that's fine. I am, I, I am not, I think that's awesome for a lot of people. I just, I could never get it out of my blood, you know, <laughs> but yeah. I think it's great. The Knoxville punk scene to me, there's been, you know, some peaks and valleys for me in my five years of part of this community. But I will say the one thing that I find to be very, like, you know, romantic about this scene is that there are so many people who are like the lifers. Like, I consider you, I consider Forrest, somebody like Tim Hayes, um, John from Grendel. They're like, they're, they're these guys, the guys from, uh, the guys from Mr. Disaster. These, these guys that have been around, like you guys have been around th this community since the mid 90s and you're still a part of it. Dude, the punk community in Charleston, West Virginia, where I'm from in the 90s was the fucking shit. We had a, we had a, a venue called The Common Grounds. Every Friday and Saturday, like there's a good show on a Friday, there's a good show on a Saturday, and every Friday and Saturday, there's 150 to 200 people at this club. There's no one from that community left. Like, yeah. there are people, we have, there's a Facebook page called the 90s Nitro West Virginia, Charleston, West Virginia punk scene that I'm a part of. And there are probably 300 people in that group. And those people are all great people, but none of them are a part of that community. There is no Charleston punk community that remains that has lifers. These like people that have been around the community since the nineties, the eighties, that just doesn't exist. The, the, the community is decent. You, know, you, you've played the empty glass in Charleston a couple of times and it's a good scene. There's great punk bands. Now there's a lot of cool punk bands popping up that are great in that community, but it's so sad for me to think like my favorite bands from my childhood, none of those people are doing anything, or if they are, they're not a part of the community. Like, for example, one of the biggest punk bands that I, in that 90s, you know, Charleston, West Virginia community was a band called Dead Ant Farm, and Dusty, the bass player for Dead Ant Farm, is still, he's a punk rock lifer, he's more of like a rock and roll guy now, and he's like a, a traveling musician, troubadour type guy who's all over the place, and that dude's a lifelong musician. He'll never, he'll be playing music till the day he dies, but he's not a part of the Charleston. He, he moved out of West Virginia in like 1999 and never looked back. And you know, mm. so like that, that community, as big as it was, it's just ceased to exist. And even the idea like myself, I don't know if you know this, but Scott Askew, uh, you know, a friend of ours, Scott is from West Virginia as well. And he and I grew up in the same community and Scott and myself and that person I mentioned, Dusty, we, we got to talk in about six months ago about doing a Charleston punk scene community reunion, like a, you know, 20 year, or 25 year, whatever you want to look at it, like, like a reunion for the, the Charleston punk community. And we found out the club, the common grounds that was like our Mercury theater. We found out that it's now a rental space. You can rent it and post shows. 
and kids do host shows there now. So I was like, fuck, let's just call it a common grounds reunion. It'd be like, imagine if you were able to rent the Mercury theater right now and throw shows and throw like a nineties Knoxville punk reunion. It would, there'd be hundreds of people there. We, we talked about it for a couple of weeks and then I realized like, holy shit, guys, if we do this, 10 people are going to show up and no one gives a fuck. So I was really bummed out by that. Like I can't believe how much, how solid of a community that is just, evaporated maybe it's west virginia maybe it's the fact that west virginia i got out it's one of those states that people when they, when they can they get out <laughs> well so yeah no it's it's yeah that's god it's hard to say because a lot of people left here but there's still i can think of so many people that are still involved in like you know one way or the other at least playing music or like you know doing tattoos and like still kind of representing like Knoxville as the way that, that it was in a way um, here, like that if something like that for the Mercury thing happened, I think there would be a lot of people. So yeah, I don't does, know. Yeah. That sucks though. You know, about does the building, the building that the Mercury theater was, does that even exist anymore? Yeah, absolutely. It's on market square. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's uh, is it the uh, fuck? It's uh, press God damn it, press pub. I couldn't get the name in my head. Yeah, so that's where the mercury was. For, For Forrest has told me that a hundred times, but my brain, <laughs> I, my memory is terrible. So you grew up basically going to Mercury like everybody did. So like the nineties was the Mercury, and then the early two thousands was well for the, me the early t- the oh sorry sorry uh, yeah. early two thousands. Um, well, the very early 2000s, uh, McGee's, Axis, there was a place called Princess Deli to put on some stuff. Ivy's put on some stuff. And then I immediately, like, I don't know, found out my whole life is going to change because I was going to have a kid, you know. Yeah. So I stepped away from everything for a little bit, although not like not far away. I still played in bands and like I just didn't play out as much or like tour at all, you know. Um but I always stayed active playing with people around here. Um, but yeah, the, then, then everything kind of changed. There was a arcade. Oh God. What was the name of it? Electric with, no, I don't remember. Maybe, I, I want to say electric wizard, but I know that's not it. Um, where like saves the day played, you know, oh, and that's God. when the whole emo takeover kind of thing started yeah. happening. If you want to call it emo, like I don't it, like these days, it's just good music. Like saves the day is amazing. Back then I did not like them, but I was, idiot so <laughs> you know like no they're they're great and they played at oh god somebody's gonna like if somebody watches this and can correct me it's not electric wizard i know that but it's something it was yeah i know where it's at but yeah there, a lot of stuff like that started happening some bands around here made some really great bands that were more emo one band i played in uh was called minute 61 uh with uh ben miller gabe miller and tyler chin at the time steve gaskell was in it for a while but then they went on to be um the invocation and the vocation is probably one of the best Knoxville bands that's ever existed. Mm. Uh, and, and Gabe, unfortunately you passed, passed away. Um, but the, what they released, what it's still out there. It's, it's fantastic. It's just you're really good. Show me that. I've never heard that name. So you're going to show me that. Uh, yeah, dude, the invocation's amazing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, did Yeah. Then, yeah, stepped away for a while and kind of, you know, laid low and then came back and yeah, now I'm just playing in like a hundred bands again, I guess. <laughs> uh, the Long Branch closed right after I moved here and I almost went to see, so I'm friends with the guys in Hawthorne Heights because I put out, before they got big, I put out a record for Hawthorne Heights, like right before they changed their name to Hawthorne Heights, they were called A Day in the Life and I put out their last record. It came out like literally the week before they they signed to victory. So we knew we, we rushed it out because we knew they were signed to victory. And so I'm friends with those guys. And right before the long branch closed, they played here in Knoxville, but I was working and I couldn't go. Yeah. And, and I saw, so I never got, I literally never even stepped foot in that venue. And I've heard so many stories. <laughs> we're talking about doing a, uh, yeah, I played long branch a bunch. Um, I remember being like 16 playing Long Branch and like the, they're like the house beer is Southpaw. I hope that's all right. It's like beer. All right, cool. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> you know, um, but uh, 
You could have said yeah. the house was anything, and your sixteen-year-old ass was going to drink it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I was sixteen. I always drank. Sorry to interrupt you. When I was sixteen, I always drank natural light because there was a guy that worked at a GoMart gas station who, if you gave him twenty dollars, he would give you a twelve pack of Natty Light. So it tastes terrible, but it, when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, it get me fucked up. It would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think, yeah, the first show I played at Long Branch, I was 16, drinking uh, Southpaw. The last show I played at Long Branch was uh, opening for Off Their Heads. That was a Monday, and it was a really good show. And it's funny because Jake's old band was on that. I didn't know Jake at the time. Like, it's funny how many times we didn't play together before we played in a band together. Uh, but yeah, Long Branch, we talked about, Last time when me and Paul were on the way to Clarksville, we were just talking in the car about like doing a reunion at what's called leaderboard now before it yeah. gets condemned because it's it's coming. You know, it's coming. That place is a piece of shit. So before it gets condemned, all of us from like back in the day who have like a part in, in the long branch and homies who like you would have liked to have been there. We make it long yeah. branch again for one night. We take it over and they can. Everybody else can fuck off, you know? Yeah. That'd so basically, awesome. you just have to meet with the, whoever owns the leaderboard and, and talk them into letting you put on a show. We don't even have to talk them into it. We'll just show up and be like, this is ours tonight. You owe us this, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or we can do it diplomatically. <laughs> we'll let somebody else handle that part. I was, down, I was downtown yesterday for work, and I got, you know how when it's 5 o'clock and – that the campus is nuts. Uh -huh. So I sat there right in front of leaderboard at that red light for like, I mean, no joke for like six minutes. Yep. And I just, I just kept looking at it and I was like, why is it called leaderboard? And after like the whole time I finally get on, on Alcoa highway <laughs> heading towards where I was going. And I realized like, Oh, leader, like leader, like a leader of beer. <laughs> I was such a dumb. I was like, what's what leaderboard mean? But who orders beer by the leader? It's like, yeah. Can I get a liter of cola? It's like you're a cop. Like, <laughs> I guess it's probably it's probably like a play on words, leader and leaderboard because football. Oh, I get what. it, but still, it's we're not drinking Mountain Dews here, dude. You know, like I don't know. I've never ordered a liter of beer. Have you ever ordered a liter of beer? No. No. Right. <laughs> so their play on words sucks. It's the Long Bridge. I wonder if the place. I, I, I think it's safe to assume this is what it is, but is it for like the 18, 19 year old college, like blonde haired chicks to go in and shake their ass? Sorry, I shouldn't say chicks. No, you know what I'm saying? No, I know what you're saying. If it is, that's even more reason we should take it over one night. <laughs> the, 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 the nice young sorority ladies from UT. Is that, is that one of their bars? I don't even know anything about it. I, I don't know. If, I can't speak from their experience, but it doesn't seem like it has a lot of like appeal to that demographic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there are other places that seem well more suited for like, we're going out and like, maybe it's for like the young alcoholics, like the ones that are just like, like, Oh man, I don't want to go to the club. I just want to get, I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't understand the name. I don't understand anything about it. So we definitely need to go and check this out. Yeah. I'm down. Yeah. We should, you know, we should just get a group of people together to go one night over there and just get a beer. That's yes. Let's do this. Let's do this really soon. That would be sick. I'm down for it. All right. So I keep saying that I'm going to keep these uh, podcasts to under thir or to 30 minutes or under, and they keep getting longer and longer, but I enjoy talking to my friends. And if no one watches this, who fucking cares? We're having a good time. I'm going to upload it anyway. And yeah. Whoever yeah. Did we go over 30 minutes? Oh, fuck yeah, we're 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 way over an hour now, but I don't give a shit. So yeah, fuck I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you my final question. Yeah, um, which is uh, so when when I when I say the word pro when I say the words pro wrestling, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Mankind. Okay, Nick are you Foley. are you a wrestling? Are you a wrestling fan? Have you I, ever I been? Yeah, yeah. I, I still I still I. I don't watch wrestling anymore. I mean, if it's on and like people are watching, I'll check it out. But like back in the day, I loved wrestling. I grew up watching wrestling and I still watch um, Dark Side of the Ring. I think that's fantastic. And uh, Tales from the Territories is great. But to me, Mick Foley, you know, Mankind and, and 
Dude Love, Cactus Jack, all the characters he was to me were just the best part of wrestling. You know, just this weird motherfucker that's willing to put his life on the line every night. And and yeah, I, I watched some of the harder core stuff too. Like the the I never watched like Nick Gage and stuff like that. But like those guys, I mean, it's just like that's is it? I guess it's wrestling. But like those guys are just getting fucking slaughtered. It's like we're watching you know just the gore fest and it's cool i love that they're willing to do that but um mick foley mankind yeah mankind leather mask and all that yeah that's 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 the first thing for me i love it i, I love talking to my friends about like i'm a huge wrestling fan and i have been basically my, my whole life so i love to kind of incorporate that in there because it's funny so far i've gotten some pretty mixed quest mixed answers but i really enjoy talking about it and to your to what you said a second ago, Dark Side of the Ring and Tales from Territories are amazing. I want to ask you your opinion though. Which did you like better of the two documentaries? They're made by the same people, like The Rock, you know, like Dwayne Johnson is the producer of the Tales, and Evan Husney, you know, wrote Tales from the Territory, and then he produces um, Dark Side. Mm -hmm. I like them both. I want you to tell me which one you enjoyed more. Well. I've only seen the Memphis episode of uh, Tales so far, okay. which was phenomenal. It's um, the best episode. The whole series is great, but the Memphis episode is the best. Yeah. Uh, Dark Side, though, has so many things that just almost every episode, like literally every episode I'm like glued to, but some of them are just, they're just next level. Like, I love that kind of like, I, I, I hate to call it entertainment, but like documentary sort of filmmaking. I just love it because it's educational, eye opening and, and just engrossing. And I just, yeah, yeah. I think uh, dark side of the ring is one of the best series of like any series that I've watched in a long time. Personally. Uh, I, I, I could watch more tales from the territories if uh, you know, you're going that way with that. But. <laughs> you, okay. So in my opinion, I like tales from the territories better. Yeah. Um, like the dark side. I just think there's a there's the dark side is a little like cheesy with the reenactments and stuff. I think that Tales from the Territories does a little bit better job of making the reenact reenactment parts less cheesy. They're both amazing series. I'm super stoked with the next season of Dark Side. I hope they make a next season of Tales, but I'm telling you, you need to watch that whole series. Like right. we we don't have Vice. We used to have Vice, but we we had like Hulu TV and then we got rid of it and I got YouTube TV. And with YouTube TV, Vice isn't on there. So I watched every season of Dark Side before we got YouTube TV. We recently got it. We recently changed. And I was like, wow, man, we, one of the channels we lost was Vice, but YouTube TV is so much cheaper than Hulu. So I was just like, screw it. I bought the, the, the first episode. The, the Memphis episode was free. Like, I think it was, it was free to stream it on YouTube. And then the other night. The other nine episodes were $1.99 each, and I just bought the whole season because I was like, fuck it. So I watched it. I think I literally watched all 10 episodes, 10 nights in a row. It took me 10 nights to watch them all When because I always go to bed way after Ann. When she went to bed, I would just, like, download an episode and watch it. And yeah. all 10 episodes are awesome. Cool. The, the, the Memphis episode is definitely the most, like, I don't know. Actually, I take that back. The episode on Bill Watts, um, on Bill Watts territory, the uh, the uh, fuck, what's that territory called? Where Jerry, Jerry the King, or where Jerry, uh, fuck, my brain sucks. Where Jim Ross started. <laughs> uh, was it somewhere uh, in Texas? It wasn't Texas. It was like, oh. uh, fuck, I'm, my, I'm having a brain fart now. That's all the <laughs> all the wrestling fans are sitting here right now yelling at me, but. <laughs> So the territory where Jim Ross got started that was owned by Cowboy Bill Watts, Watts' territory, the episode on his territory is batshit crazy because that guy was crazy. like the, the promoter. Like imagine Vince McMahon it just like right now in 2003, 2023, pulling a gun on, you know, like Brock Lesnar. Like they're, they're literally like telling stories about fucking the owner of the territory, Bill Watts, pulling a gun on his his own wrestlers and shit like it's it's pretty wild holy shit yeah all right that that sounds worth checking out for sure <laughs> so would you say that mick foley is your favorite pro wrestler um yeah i would say that 
Yeah, I'd say that for sure. It's a good answer. Have you ever seen any of his uh, t- any of his death matches in Japan? Like, Man, with, yeah, you know, like oh. him and Terry Funk, or him and uh, fuck. My brain sucks. Son. I got to stop. I have to stop drinking alcohol when I do these interviews, Chris. <laughs> Make me brain go bleh. No, my brain's always kind of funky. It's like, yeah, there's a balance. But um, yeah, I know Terry Funk. Oh, my God. Yeah, Terry Funk's rad, too. Like, those guys, they just, yeah. They they cared about the art of it, too. Like, I, I, I don't know. I can't speak on things. But, like, I think there's, like, a difference between, like, some of the matches where it's just like watch us bleed to death we're gonna die you know yeah. and like the matches where it's like let's hurt ourselves we put on a i don't know they're all putting on a show i can't speak to that you know i'm wrong I'm trying to <laughs> um so yeah i'm just gonna leave that there but yeah no mankind and and especially you know like that but mick foley yeah bang bang he's my dude i like him <laughs> I like yeah. it. I think, yeah. I think bang bang is a good way to end the night. Yeah. I, yes, I appreciate you doing this, man. Of course, man. I'm sorry I went over. Like, you know, we get to talking and, you know, it's, it's, it's just all good. But it's not you, buddy. It's me. Oh, uh, hey. I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here watching the clock and I just keep I just keep going. But it, it is what it is, man. Like I said, people are gonna watch. If they if they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. I'm not yeah, doing this for fuck off. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm, I mean, really, I'm just doing this to have content on, on you. I, I have fun with this. It gives me an opportunity to talk to my friends one on one and long form. And some people I haven't talked to, like my, my my guest last week was Jerry from the Downstrokes. And I haven't talked to him. I spoke to him on the phone, but I haven't spoke to him, you know, eye to eye for over a year. So this is a really cool opportunity for me to catch up with friends. And even, you know, you and I see each other on a weekly basis, but still we don't talk for an hour straight without having somebody else zip in. And, oh, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're always, always. Bar at a show and you can't really. So this is probably the longest forum conversation you and I have ever had. So <laughs> if nobody watches these podcasts, I'm getting a lot out of it. I hope that my guests enjoy it. And, you know, Dude, it's yeah, it's I, been a good talk. I'm hoping to put, you know, I, more content maybe maybe the channel will get built up and you know i just want to help people out man like you know you know how this goes for me i'm not trying to make money or anything with coffin curse i'm just trying to not lose money and have a good time and help friends out and if i can help somebody out and you know if some if i can get a thank you from a friend for you know putting out a tape for somebody or putting them on a podcast that, that's all i care about you're kicking ass mike you're doing everything right man like I, I don't i'm pretty sure i've told you before but you're doing everything right you're, I appreciate you're out, yeah, love you, man. I love yeah. you too. Thanks for your time, and uh, I will. Uh, I'll link. You know, I always ask this question, but we all we know. I'll I'll link all of your socials and everything in the description. So if you want to listen to anything from Mortars, if you're if you're checking this out and you've never heard Mortars or Rough Dreams or James Lee and the rest, I will put all of Chris's um, links in the description. And that song we were talking about earlier, the early part of the podcast. We were talking about your Christmas song that was on my Shitter's Full comp. I'm going to link that to the to the Bandcamp download. I'll make it a free stream download. You can have it for free because I want people to check it out because it's a great song and it'll make you cry if you're in the right mood. And if you're just a, a fat 42 year old man who cries when his friends send him really good songs, then you can do that. 